Good morning, everybody. Man, y'all look so good. Everybody being in the Christmas spirit this time of year around, it's awesome. Glad you guys are here. Hey, before I get going this morning, and I got some notes, um, I got a few things to share with you before we get started. Pastor Blake and I were just laughing back there as he came off the stage saying, wow, that was a lot. We have this, 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 this. And then we're playing video announcements. And I was like, and I got three more things I got to say before we start. There's a lot going on at the King's house, but that's a good thing. Someone say, amen. Seriously, from where we were three and a half years ago to where we are today is absolutely incredible. So the first thing I got to say is I'm so stinking proud of my church. I love you guys so much. And this is why when you see a need, you meet it. And last week was the very first announcement we ever made about the very first time us doing this thing called the angel tree. And it's that tree out there in the great hall, not the really big one, but the one by the info wall. And last week we announced that you can go by the angel tree and you can pick an angel off of that tree. And that represents a kid whose parents or parents may be incarcerated during this holiday season. And we wanna help those kids feel like they're not forgotten and that they're remembered and that you can adopt them, so to speak, by getting them Christmas gifts. First announcement, first day, all the kids called for. I am so stinking proud of you guys. Thank you so much. And thank you to Sarah Singer for setting that up. It's incredible, guys. It's incredible. So if you did grab one of those angels, be sure to bring that gift back before December 19th, okay? So when? Before December 19th. You guys got it. The second thing is that I really want to hit home with um, that Christmas Eve service that we're having. Since I've been here for the past six years, we've never had a Christmas Eve service, right, Blake? No. So this is going to be incredible, guys. Um, one of my fondest memories, there goes my water. Good thing the lid was on. <laughs> one of my fondest memories as a kid growing up was Christmas Eve. Um, of course, Christmas Eve just has that Christmas magic to it, right, guys? But I would always go to my grandma's house with my parents for a Christmas Eve party. And my mom is the youngest of eight kids. So it was a big Christmas party every Christmas Eve. I'm talking 50 to 80 people in this house, right? We would play the white elephant gift exchange game. Anybody done that before? Yeah, but we did it multiple times. So there were hundreds of Christmas presents all around this tree and the food, come on somebody, the food, man, it was incredible. But this is the thing I'll never forget is that before the party would ever start, my parents would load me and my sister up and take us to our church for a communion together as a family. And as a kid, I didn't really see it at the time, but as a grown up and as a parent, I now realize that my parents parents really set such a wonderful example of putting Jesus number one before anything else. So I know the hustle and bustle of the holidays and parties and this and that, but King's House, I really want to encourage you, make this one of your family traditions this holiday season. Come to our Christmas Eve service. It's from five to six. We're going to be having carols by candlelight. We're going to have communion together, and you're going to get out of here in less than an hour, Pastor Mark said. He really wanted me to tell you, you'll be out of here in less than an hour, so you can go do your Christmas stuff, okay? It's incredible, and here's why we really want to push you guys to come to that is because as a church, we are people who give and then give some more. Someone say amen. And we're not just about your money. We give our talents. We give our time. And you guys, I'm not kidding. Out of the four churches that I've been on staff at, technically three, one of them relaunched their names. But anyway, um, you guys are literally the best volunteers that I've ever had the privilege of serving with. And I'm not exaggerating because you always go out and you serve and you do here and outside of here. So with all that being said, the church pastoral staff and leadership wants to give back to our volunteers and we wanna give them a Sunday off. So on Sunday, December 26th, the day after Christmas, there will not be church at the King's house. We want our families to have time with their families, okay? So important. So if you're like, what? This is new. If you show up on the 26th, ain't no one gonna be here. We're gonna be in our Christmas PJs unwrapping presents with our kids, probably re-eating the Christmas food from the day before. You know what I mean? Because there's so much of it. But that's why we wanna say, hey guys, come to the Christmas Eve service. Someone say, amen. So let's dive in today really quick. Pastor Mark started the very last sermon series of this year called Real Love. And I love that he's talking about love during this holiday season because sometimes when churches talk about love, we, we do it during um, February, Valentine's Day, you know what I'm saying? Marriage conference coming up, guys. Our second one right here at the King's house. But listen, the reason why I love it because so much is because Christmas is really all about love. It really is. Think about it. Famous scripture, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he, the ultimate Christmas present, right? 
I mean, you, you can't top that. So and it is proven that people tend to show more love and generosity to their friends and their family and even complete strangers during this time of year. And last week, Pastor Mark opened this up by talking about that word love, that it's not a noun, it's actually a verb. It's an action. To love your neighbor as yourself is really what he honed in on. And it's not always easy, right? <laughs> it's not always convenient. Pastor Mark said it's spurred on by seeing the value in other people. Well, today I wanna to talk to you about what I like to call the Christmas love. And all the women who like Hallmark just went, oh, the Christmas love. It's not that kind of love, okay? No, it's what I like to call the Christmas love. See, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And this morning, I want us to just kind of take a quick moment to think about that real kind of love and how it still affects us today, 2,000 plus years later. And I wanna break down one scripture this morning. I've got several, but the main one I wanna highlight for you this morning, if you got your Bibles or you're taking notes, it's 1 John chapter 3, verses one through two, and it's coming out of the New King James Version. But this is what it says. It says, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. I got three points for you this morning, King's House, about this Christmas love and how it affects you today. And the first one is that we can actually see this kind of love. We can. It's kind of hard to think about because we can't physically see Jesus, right? Because when John wrote this, he kind of had it in, in a lucky streak because he was right there with Jesus. He was one of his BFS, one of his disciples. He ate with them. They bunked in the same room together. They traveled together. He saw the love of God through Jesus in everything he said and in everything he did. It's easy to see God's love when you can physically see Jesus, but we can't, right? But John wrote the first word in that scripture, behold, which means to what? to look, to see, right? And some people say, and it's mainly non-believers, that um, Christians are just blinded by faith. Anyone heard that before? Christians are just blinded by faith. The thing is, we do believe, but not with our physical eyes, but with our spiritual eyes. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the things not yet seen. Someone say amen to that, right? And so John was able to do all that and he's writing and so many authors wrote in the Bible accounts of Jesus so that we can still see Jesus through his birth, through his life, through his burial, his death and his resurrection. And we can still see him even today. How? Well, if we're putting into practice what Pastor Mark talked with us last week about, about that agapeo type love of loving your neighbor, we can see Jesus through each other and through others who are loving us the way Jesus loves. It's why one of my favorite scriptures right here is 1 John 4, 10. If you're like, what is love? That song, what is love? Baby, don't hate me. This is why I'm not a singer on the stage, guys. That's, that's my wife's department. Listen, in 1 John 4, 10, it says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Here's a little sub note for number one of we can see God's love. We can actually see it in the manger. Think about it, it's Christmas time. We see the nativity scene all the time and, and we see just this amazing example of how God packaged himself wrapped up in skin and put him as a baby in a manger. No wonder to Christians, the manger scene, the nativity scene, the Christmas story is so beautiful to our eyes because it brings hope. Jesus is the light of the darkness. And when God sent him, because when Jesus was born, I don't know if you know this or not, but it was filled with pagan religiosity, hatred, strife, sin, the world was dark. So Jesus said, or God said, I'm gonna send Jesus and he's gonna be the light. The nativity scene is just such a wonderful example of God's hope. We can see it through the nativity scene, but we can also see it through the cross because let's, let's face it, there's no cross if there's no manger scene, right? When God sent Jesus into this world, it was with the sole purpose that he was going to live a sinless, blameless life 
And he was gonna take your sin and my sin and he was gonna nail it on that cross of Calvary to forever put to death sin itself and death so that you could have eternal life, right? I got some good news for you, King's House. God loves you and there's absolutely nothing you can do to change that. Some of y'all need to hear that again because it's really good. God loves you and there's absolutely nothing you can do to change that. (laughs) It's true. And that's what I love about it so much because we can look at the manger scene and we can say, oh, sweet baby Jesus, silent night, no crying he made. I'm pretty sure he cried. He was a baby. (laughs) Pretty, I'm sure he had holy poop too because he was a baby. He was fully God, yet still fully human. Anyway, all that to say, (laughs) potty humor. I'm sorry, kids pastor coming out of me. (laughs) some scholars and historians actually are led to believe through their studies when they're examining the life of Christ that the wood that made up the manger was also the same wood that made up the cross don't know if that's actually true or not but it is fun to think about it's because the plan to save the human race to save mankind wasn't this oh god I forgot about this oh my me let's send Jesus there we go no From the very beginning, the Bible says God had a plan. And I love that because if I could ever fit God between these two ears, God's not big enough for me. His ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. So this Christmas season, I wanna encourage you to look for and see God's Christmas love through the nativity scene and through the cross of Calvary. The second thing is, is that we can actually experience this kind of love. I'm over here bawling like a baby during worship as we are just sitting in God's presence because I'm experiencing God's love. Anyone else with me on that? You don't wanna admit that you're crying? It's okay, I got you. I mean, my eyes were a complete wreck. I'm like, oh, why are they sweating? Good Lord. I I cry when I'm in God's presence because I'm just so grateful for his love for me, for me. He saved me, like I don't deserve this. Like pick someone else, God, someone else is way worthy than me, but God still chose me and he still chose you. We can experience God's love. A great philosopher once said this phrase right here. I think, therefore I am. But a Christian, a believer, a real follower of Christ would say, no, God loves, therefore I am. God loves, therefore I am forgiven. God loves, therefore I am made new. I'm made whole. I'm strengthened. I'm called. I'm anointed. I'm equipped. Whatever it takes, you become his. And you can experience God's love. And here's one way you can experience it is that you can experience it through your identity. Because here's the thing, King's House, and we all probably know this, but one of the best things ever to experience on this planet is when you say yes to Jesus to being your Lord and Savior. He was already your Lord and Savior before you said yes to him because what your decision makes doesn't change the fact that he died on the cross for everyone's sins, right? So when we say yes to Jesus, the Bible says the old you has gone, but the new you has come. It's like a new birth, the Bible says. It's being born again. It's becoming a child of God. We celebrate the birth of Jesus during Christmas, but you can celebrate your new birth through Jesus all throughout the year because he took you from your mess and made it into a message. Yeah. I'm getting ahead of myself in my notes here because the second thing is of experiencing it is in your testimony. As a child of God, you come to this gripping reality of, I'm a child of God. I am a child. Me and Jesus share the same daddy. We're, we're, because he's God's son, he's a child of God. I'm a child. Me and Jesus share the same daddy, which means Jesus is like my big brother who set the perfect example for me to lay one's life down for someone so that they can live. I have everything that Jesus has because the Bible says we have inherited everything according to Jesus. You are God's child. Listen, that's your identity. You once were a sinner and now you're saved by grace. Now you're a saint and you're being perfect, made perfect in his righteousness. We talked about this several months ago, right? But the Bible who calls us the truth of being God's children, sometimes we kind of push that aside because the world is really good at giving you a false identity. And even as a believer, even unknowingly, we will take on these false identities. 
And maybe you're carrying some right now, the ones to where maybe it's someone has spoken this over you. Maybe it's just something you've spoken over yourself, but things like you're dumb, you're worthless. You are a horrible husband and father. You are absolutely ridiculous. No one wants you. No one wants to be around you. You're fat, you're ugly, you're gay, whatever it is. These are false identities that the world and even ourselves put upon ourselves. And Jesus says, hold up. That's not who you are. You are mine and that's not you. You are a child of God. Did you know that even Jesus himself, again, fully God, but yet fully man, was tempted to question his identity as God's son? Go back with me really quick. Jesus just got done being baptized by John the Baptist and the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness for 40 days to not have anything to eat. He hangry, okay? And he's being tempted directly by the devil. We can't say that the devil made me do it. We can't. He's being tempted directly by Satan. Every single time he tempted him, he questioned what? His identity. If you are the son of God, if you are a child of God, do this and that. And what I love about Jesus' example in through this for us as children of God is that he would always combat it with the truth of God's word, which is why... I'm really excited as one of the pastors on staff here is that Pastor Mark is going to help us grow together as a body of believers in this new year of reading the Bible in one year together as a body of believers. It's because King's House, we can't just know God's word here. You have to have it here. It's one of the scriptures in the Bible. It says, if you hide God's word in your heart, that's when you're like, I'm not gonna sin against God because I don't just know it here. It becomes your lifestyle. It becomes something that you are adapted into because it's who you are. You are a child of God. So you can experience this through everything God has done for you in your identity and you can experience it through your testimony. See, as a child of God, we all have a testimony, right? It's true. That testimony is the thing that says, This is where I was before Jesus. This is how and when I met Jesus. And this is who I am because of Jesus, right? Listen, your testimony of how God saved you is gonna reach people that my testimony is never gonna touch. And my testimony is gonna reach people that your testimony is never gonna touch. This is why King's House, it is so important for us to not just share our testimony, but to live out your testimony. There's a famous uh, quote, I don't even know who says it, but says that um, you are the, how does it go? You could be the only Jesus someone will ever know. So through that, always preach your testimony, always preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. So through your life, through your testimony is how you're able to tell other people about this. Every time I think about my testimony personally, I think back about how when I was a teenager and I was in a drama, not a drama club, it was more like a drama team, and they called themselves Youth for Truth. Most of us were believers. This wasn't a church thing. We went to school assemblies and we did skits about abstinence and um, secondary abstinence and just trying to stay abstinent. That's what schools want for kids these days, I guess, or then. Anyway, so being homeschooled, yay, homeschool high five. Anyway, I'm in the back seat of this truck as we're driving and everybody in the car is sharing their testimony. Everyone is talking about how I mean, at age 15, 16, 17, they've already had premarital sex. They've had an abortion. They've had miscarriages. They've done drugs. They've had alcohol. Their parents are divorced. They're this, they're that. And then the buck stops with me. Hey, Chris, tell us about your testimony. Sheltered old homeschool Chris. Oh boy. Why are you laughing? Listen. I remember sitting in the back seat of that truck. I said, guys, my testimony is not as cool and as powerful as y'all's. To see how God brought you out of all this to restore you to where you are today. I never, I have never had sex with somebody outside of marriage. I've never done drugs. I've never done alcohol. My parents are happily married. And I start going down the list and they're like, bro, I'll never forget what the leader said as he's driving. He goes, don't underestimate your testimony because it's probably one of the most powerful ones out there because not everyone can say that they could walk through this like you have. And it stuck with me because 
I always thought a powerful testimony was those that you hear where they were going through hell and God brought them through it. But then it just encouraged me that my testimony can truly reach people that those testimonies never could. And the same with you. Don't underestimate your testimony, King's House. Here's the last point I wanna make today is how can we um, experience God's Christmas love? Well, we can see it, we can experience it, but we can also know it. Someone say, know it. Because when John wrote that scripture that we opened up with in 1 John, he actually was very confident and he said, we are children of God. He didn't say, and maybe one day we'll become children of God. And if you hope and pray good enough, maybe you'll become a child of God. He said with confidence, we are children of God. It's your identity. I looked up that um, word no in that scripture in the Greek, and it actually, it means I do. And the definition of it is to know by seeing and by experiencing a state or condition. I just thought that was really awesome because my first point was you can know this by seeing, you can know this love by experiencing, and by knowing is literally first by seeing and experiencing. I thought that was really cool. I wanted to throw that out there for you. But how can you actually know this Christmas love? Well, the first one is that you can actually know that he is with us. He is with us. It's that Christmas time of year. There's this prophecy from Isaiah who actually spoke a prophecy foretelling of Jesus's birth. And it's in Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14. And this was his prophecy. He said, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. King's House, did you know this famous scripture right now that I just read to you? It's also in Luke. You can read it about the Christmas story. Did you know that Isaiah actually spoke that prophecy 700 years before the birth of Christ? 700 years before the birth of Christ. I don't know what you're experiencing this holiday season. It could be the first for you to where you're sitting down at a Christmas dinner and across the table is an empty seat where a loved one would have been sitting this year. I don't know if you're facing depression because all of these false identities you've taken upon yourself even unknowingly and you're seeking lower and lower in the background while everyone else seems to be having all this cheerful Christmas joy and you're not understanding why do I feel this way? I don't know if you're one of those parents who's like me and you're kind of stressed out a little bit like if we pay all the bills will be great but then what about all these amazing materialistic toys that the world wants me to buy for my children to say that they had a good Christmas? I don't know what you're facing this holiday season, but I know this about you friends, is that God is with you. Even when you don't see him, even when you don't feel him, I certainly felt him this morning through worship. He is with you. He has never left you. He has never forsaken you. And friends, he never will. He never will. And if we're just all gut-riching honest with each other, we have all experienced a moment of this darkness feeling of God, where are you? And I remember growing up in my house, walking through my, my parents' house growing up, just the years of the hustle and bustle of going in and out the doors, a picture would always catch my eye and I would catch myself reading it occasionally. And it has stuck with me all these years. It was a wooden plaque of a poem from an unknown author called Footprints in the Sand. Anyone heard of it before? And it just still is engrained in my mind because the words of this poem were printed in a way to where it made up the shape of a footprint. And I took so much, I guess, hope in this poem as I read it growing up as a teenager and even still today to know that I'm not the only one that feels like God has left me. But even more so of what this author was feeling when he wrote this and the encouragement it brings. So this morning, I just briefly wanna to read to you it's a short one, but I wanna to read to you this poem called Footprints in the Sand because I want it to encourage you this morning. One night I dreamed a dream and as I was walking along the beach with my Lord, across the dark sky flashed scenes of my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one belonging to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand and I noticed that 
at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I, I don't understand why when I needed you the most, you would leave me. And he whispered, my precious child, there's your identity again. I love you and I will never leave you. Never ever during your trials and testings, when you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I was carrying you. And that just sticks in my mind so much growing up. And I can look back at my life and I know you can too in those darkest times where you felt lost and alone. God was carrying you friends and he still is carrying you today in the times where you feel like you can't stand. God is with you in your highest of highs and he's with you in your lowest of lows. He will never leave you or forsake you. That phrase right there, I will never leave you or forsake you shows up multiple times throughout scripture in both the Old and New Testament. So as a believer, we can take heart of what he said is true. And I'm gonna top it off on one more King's house. Did you know that the final recorded physical words of our savior Jesus was not, it is finished. It's not. The Bible says that Jesus said, it is finished. He died, he was buried, he rose again. He was alive for 40 days, walking amongst people. Hundreds of people witnessed him being resurrected. And in Matthew chapter 28, one of my most absolute favorite scriptures, it's the great commission. Jesus is gathering everybody together and he's literally ascending into heaven. And he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. His last words of utterance wasn't peace. See you later. I love you. See you in heaven. No, it was, and surely I am with you always, even until the very end of the age. Well, Chris, that doesn't really make sense if the angels are going, oh, ah, and as Jesus is lifting up in the air and he's like, I'm gonna be with you, twinkles. Jesus, how are you gonna be with us if you're leaving us? Jesus said, no, it's best that I go because when I leave, I'm gonna send someone better than me. I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit who can be with all of my children at all times, everywhere, teaching them, guiding them, comforting them, knowing that he is with them. King's house, take heart today that he is Emmanuel, that he is with us. And lastly, you can know this kind of Christmas love by knowing his peace. Right now we live in a world of utter fear, don't we? Everyone's scared of COVID, everyone's scared of this, everyone's scared of that. And that fear can start taking you in places in your mind you don't wanna go, friends. And it's easy to go there though, if we're honest with ourselves, it's easy to go there. But we can know his perfect peace. That same prophecy that Isaiah was speaking 700 years before Jesus's birth, it goes on a few more chapters. And in Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, he goes on proclaiming of Jesus's birth for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and what? Prince of Peace. Jesus is your peace. He is with you. He is comforting you. And in those times where you're like, where are you, God? I encourage you, King's house, worship him. Push out those thoughts of abandonment because as a child of God, you are not abandoned and put your focus on him and watch him comfort you. I'm reading a devotional right now from one of my favorite pastors and authors, Levi Lesko. Anybody heard of Levi Lesko before? One of my favorites, love that guy. And I'm reading a 40 day devotional right now and I'm almost half, I'm more than halfway through it. And uh, I wrote this down as I was getting ready for this and we're talking about peace. I thought it was really funny because I, I couldn't word it any way better. And some of you guys need to hear this, is that God is not scared of what you're scared of. 
Never really thought of that before. God is not scared of what you're scared of. So you don't have to fear. But instead, naming that fear and bringing it before the Lord is the art of going through it, even if it means he carries you through it. He goes on to say that just because you don't have to fear doesn't mean that you'll never feel afraid because God's protection is not the same as exemption. That one's good, I gotta read that one again. God's protection over your life is not the same as exemption. Because he says that there's gonna be trials and testings we have to go through, but it's us that can carry God's peace with us wherever we go. Here's my last scripture. It's one of my favorites. It's in Philippians chapter four, verse six. The apostle Paul was writing about God's perfect peace. And instead of being fearful, instead of being anxious, instead of worrying about all of this, he encourages us today, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your heart, your emotions, and will guard your mind and your thoughts. Lord, I can't thank you enough for your Christmas kind of love. The love that not only we can see the love that not only we can experience, but the kind of love that we can absolutely know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you are with us, that you comfort us, that you give us peace. And Lord, I know that there are families in this room and even those who are watching online who are going through a dark time right now. And God, I pray the encouragement from that poem, Footprints in the Sand, will remind each and every one of us that you are Emmanuel, you are with us. And God, in our weaknesses, you are made strong. God, I pray a perfect peace to cover our minds and our hearts as we continue to go through the rest of this year and enter into a new one. Lord, that we will walk out of here with a boldness that we are children of God and that you love us so much. And there's nothing we can do to change it. Bless each and every one of them this week, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen and amen.